Hi, this is Ken Mary from Fifth Angel, and you're watching Richard Metal Fan. Check it out. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Richard Metal Fan Interviews. This is episode number 146, I believe. And today's guest, we're talking to Ken Mary. Ken Mary is the drummer for the band Fifth Angel, kind of a, a heavy power metal band from Bellevue, Washington. Today we're going to be talking to him about what got him into metal, as well as the history of the band, as well as their new album called When Angels Kill, which is out now at the Nuclear Blast Records, and talk about differences between playing with other bands like Flotsam and Jetsam and etc. So, without further ado, let's go talk to Ken. So, what's up, guys? I'm here with Ken Mary from Fifth Angel. So, how are you doing today, Ken? I'm doing fantastic. How are you, Richard? Doing pretty well. Well, it's great to be able to talk with you today. So kind of what I wanted to do is to, to talk, do like a rundown of your discographies, as well as I want to talk about the new Fifth Angel album, but take me back to like okay. young Ken Mary. So growing up, what were the first bands that got you into metal and what made you want to start playing drums? Well, um, drums, I always talk about this. I think drums picked me. When I was very young, I was always hitting it all pencils and pens on the desk and markers and pots and pans and, you know, all that kind of stuff with paint brushes, you know, whatever it was, I was going to play drums with it. So <clears throat> when they, when you got into, uh, you know, the latter part of your um, elementary school education, you know, they said, well, you know, what instrument do you want to play back then? You know, they wanted everybody to have some sort of background in an instrument. And with me, it was never a question. It wasn't like, oh, maybe I should play, you know, piano or something. It was like drums, duh. You know, so it was, it was just immediate. And I, I loved them and I obviously got into them. Uh, I grew up in Seattle. There was a teacher there named Dick Stensland who introduced me to bands like Yes and Return to Forever and artists like Buddy Rich and Louis Belson and rudimental drumming and latin and per latin percussion and latin drumming so so a variety of styles and um and then i saw a kiss concert <laughs> when i was 11 years old and that kind of uh that kind of changed that was a little bit of a game changer you know when you're a kid and you know you see bombs going off and you know confetti and flames and uh, audience screaming and these cool songs i mean you know what else is there right so yeah. uh, when i saw kiss i was like I want to do that. And, you know, then I, I got a little bit older and I saw Rush and Queen and, and so many of the, you know, you know I, I wasn't really exposed to Led Zeppelin. They were just a hair before my time, really. And um, so I, I discovered them in the late 80s. There's a funny story about that, though. I was on a, a flight to Europe with House of Lords and I had just purchased a, uh, a portable CD player and I bought Led Zeppelin 4. And so I'm listening to this thing and, you know, John Bonham, I mean, that's certainly, I knew, you know, Stairway to Heaven and some of the hits or whatever, but I didn't really know, you know, the band really. And, uh, and so I'm listening on this flight, listening to drums and everything going, man, this, you know, these drums are killer. This is all killer. And, uh, so I'm telling everybody in the band, like, Hey, you guys, you know, you gotta, you gotta check this out. You know, I was the, always the youngest guy in the band. So they're, they're laughing at me. They're like, Oh, you just figured out who Led Zeppelin is, huh? And I was like, "Yeah, I guess I did." <laughs> so, so, so that, that's uh, in a nutshell. My my three biggest influences were probably Buddy Rich, Neil Peart, and John Bonham uh, were probably my three biggest influences. Awesome. And and where were you? Where were your, some of like your bands like before you started up Fifth Angel? Because I I see like on on your page on Metal Archives, you're in quite a few. Uh, not really. Uh, I was I was pictured on a TKO album uh, that I didn't play on. Actually, um, I'm trying below to think of belt. what else is out before Fifth Angel. I, yeah, below the belt. Well, below the belt, I played on. I was pictured on something else. Maybe it is below the belt. No, wait a second. Um, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't mean to be confused <laughs> about my own career, but that yeah. that was a few minutes ago. So. Uh, below the belt, I did play on, uh, in your face, I'm, I'm on a picture, but I, I did not play on. And, um, I think Fifth Angel is my first album out. Well, I'll have to look at the, t uh, the, the, the year on below the belt, but I thought Fifth Angel was my first album. I just said that in the last interview, so I might have to go correct that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I feel like Metal Archives is like Wikipedia. <laughs> I was telling like a couple other people I've interviewed well, like that. Well, they are correct about a lot of 
they're correct about a lot of things. And I do have a, you know, an extensive discography. I mean, to be honest with you, I often forget, you know, like they're sometimes when I'm touring in Europe or in the United States, you know, a, a fan will bring up like a stack of like 30 albums that I played on. And I'll be like, Oh, I forgot. I forgot. I played on that. Oh, and that, Oh, I forgot about that. You know, cause after a while, it's just, it's, it's a lot of stuff, you know, but I mean, it's, yeah. it's been a blessing, you know, I've certainly worked with incredible musicians over the years and, and, uh, you know, very, very happy and, and very fortunate to have done that. Yeah, I know you also played with like Accept and Alice Cooper, Chastain, Stain, like, like so many bands. Like, how do you, how do you manage, manage to like, like, like play with all those bands at that time? Well, it's funny because everybody thinks I was in like 10 million bands, but I was really in um, Fifth Angel, Alice Cooper, House of Lords, um, obviously Flotsam and Jetsam. Uh, I think as far as actually being a member, like except I was on a tour, they called me in because their drummer uh, had some back issues and had to leave the tour. Um, but, you know, I was a member of, of Alice's band, Fifth Angel, uh, House of Lords, and Flotsam and Jetsam. Um, every, a lot of the other stuff was more recording where, you know, you go in, you play your parts, um, you know, I played on five Chris and Pelletary albums. I mean, I would almost call me a member of, of Pelletary because of that. I think the majority of his records that I played on, uh, I played on, I think, three Chastain albums, maybe more. Um, but but yeah, it's like, you know, you go in, you do your work, <clears throat> the record gets done, it comes out. And uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean you're a, you know, a full fledged band member. Does that make any sense? Yeah. Yeah, I get what you're saying. So, and, and, and with like all those bands that you played in, and is there like a different like mind frame depending on like the band you're playing, or do you ever have to like change up like you're playing depending on like the like the style of bands that they're that you're playing with? Like I know, except is like heavy metal, and of course, oh, is sort of power metal. Absolutely, I mean, there's there's a change with every artist, you know, and you and you think about you know like let's take Alice Cooper for instance, and. You know, you think about the just the sheer, you know, back when when we were touring, this is, you know, later 80s. And, uh, you know, metal was it was what they call the metal Alice period. And, you know, it was a ball of fire. I mean, you know, I, you, you think back to those days and I've never seen crowds go that nuts like ever. Maybe the European crowds today. But the back then, I'd never seen crowds in the United States go as crazy as they did on those Alice shows. You know, the lights would go down. And, and just, you know, and then you see Alice there getting ready to go on stage and he's, you know, he's just like, you know, all of a sudden he's Alice Cooper because, you know, off stage he's, he's kind, you know, and he's very intelligent and funny. And all of a sudden when it's, when he hits that stage, he becomes Alice Cooper. And I never saw him break character except for one time uh, in all the, you know, in the years that we toured together, I, I, I never saw him break character except for once. And, uh, so anyway, yes, it's a different thing. Like for something like that, it's about the power and aggression. Um, it, and on some things like Flotsam, it's a little more about the precision and the speed. Um, you know, Fifth Angel, maybe a little more about the groove. So every artist you're going to play with and be in, it's going to be, there are going to be minor adjustments that you have to make to your playing usually. I mean, you know, it depends on how different the artists are too. If the artists are very similar, then you may not have to adjust that much. All right. And tell me about how you started Fifth Angel, because I believe Fifth Angel formed in 1984. And how'd you get to know the guys? Sure. Well, I didn't. Well, it's funny. You know, they I don't know where it, it's I guess it must be written up in the the press like that, that I started it. It, it was actually started. Well, this the singer Ted Pilot and Ed Sane and I had all played together since literally we were kids. I mean, I think I, I was in junior high when they saw me play and they and they asked me to be their drummer. Um, but Fifth Angel was like sort of grown out of that band. It was the core of Ed, Ted, myself, and also a guitarist named James Bird. But as far as forming the band, you know, I, I, I was I was one of the original members, obviously. But, uh, you know, they always say I formed it, which is not 100 percent correct. I mean, the core of that band was there. Uh, James, Ted, Ned were certainly, you know, they were working on material, brought me in, of course. So, um you know, I, I, I guess I guess I'm just correcting if there's any uh, misstatement there, but but certainly I'm one of the original members and was there from the beginning and was there for all the uh, formative writing and recording and and all of that. And so, 
you know, uh, I just don't want to take too much credit, I guess. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But tell me about like the making of the day, de- the self-titled debut album. Um, but more, what was sort of like sure. the, the thought process making that? Because I believe your f- first label was Sh- Shrapnel Records. Like, how did they find Fifth Angel? Well, Shrapnel Records, uh, we sent them a demo, and we had sent demos to tons of labels, and nobody was interested. Mike Varney uh, from Shrapnel called me. I remember being, you know, I'm a teenager at this point, negotiating on the phone with him uh, points and things that I have no idea. I don't even understand really what we're doing, but but we're talking about negotiating a record deal. And Mike was awesome. I mean, he really walked us through the process. He funded us. Um, well, actually, the first original, the original album, the self-title, was self-funded. Uh, and we did have that done. And then Mike Varney took it and put it out. But he did uh, obviously pick it up, put it on his label, gave us some money for doing that. And um, uh, as far as the process, were you interested in the recording process? Is that what yeah. you were asking? Pretty much like like where was it recorded and sort of like the mind frame and the mind, sure. the headspace behind making the album. Well, well, the headspace, you know, with Fifth Angel, I, I learned a tremendous amount that that's really stuck with me through the rest of my career. Um, we were we were committed to doing a record and making it great. You know, we wanted to have great songs. We wanted it to be executed perfectly. And you got to remember back then there was no Pro Tools. There was no fixing things. You know, it was two inch tape and you had to have your songs arranged and you had to play them properly. And we had to lay down a solid drum part. Then we had to lay down killer rhythms and bass and vocals. And, you know, we took the time to craft that record and really do our best to make it a great album. You know, and here we are, you know, 36 or whatever years later or whatever, still talking about it. So I think that was something that was our mindset. Our mindset was to go in and do something great. If you had told me at the time, we're still going to be talking about this album in 2023. I don't know if I would have believed you. I probably would have said, well, that's kind of a far fetch. I don't I don't know. We'll be talking about it then. But the fact that we are is, is really a tribute to the fact that our mindset was excellence. You know, we wanted to do everything we did with absolute excellence. And um, we were committed to doing that. We paid the money to do that. We took the time to do that. It was recorded at Steve Lawson Studios in Seattle. And we had to do it at night because the day hours, I think at that point, were like $150 an hour. And if you record it at night, I think like after nine or 10, you got it for $50 an hour. So, you know, we actually recorded the album for $50 an hour back in 1985 dollars, which is probably, you know, $150 today. So it was not cheap, um, but we really took our time and, and uh, made a great record. The The engineer, the, produ- the engineer who co-produced the album with us is a guy named Terry Date. That was yeah. his first record as well. Oh, wow. And he went on to... Oh, he went on to produce Pantera, Soundgarden, Deftones, I think Limp Bizkit, like tons of major, major records. And that was his very first album. And I think we all learned a tremendous amount doing this record together. And I think he took some of that and and carried it on into into his re- future recordings, too. I know we all learned a tremendous amount. So it was a it was a sort of a little bit of a magical time. You know, this is the uh, mid 80s and, you know, metal is king in Seattle. You know, we had Queensryche, we had Metal Church, we had Fifth Angel, uh, we had Air Apparent, we had uh, Q5 and TKO. And, you know, it was a metal town. And uh, so it was it was sort of a, a, a you know, I, I can't say it other than a magical time. And we learned a tremendous amount. We had a lot of fun doing this, this, uh, this record. Yeah, I just think it's a great great album like i remember like i heard like uh in the fallout which is just a very catchy song it's just really fast and the, then shout it out and call the warning it has like some really, really great ever like so, great musicianship and then then the title track fifth angel is probably the best song on here it's very epic sounding as well it's like everything about this just re- like every song just flows like perfectly well thank you very much you know we worked very hard to to make it great and and I, I think, you know, I listen to it today. I'm still very proud of it. I mean, it sounds like, it sounds like a very expensive, well-crafted record. And, you know, the, the great mu- there was great musicians involved. And, you know, Terry Date did a fantastic job. And, you know, I'm, I'm very proud of, of that album. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and when, it, when, when the first album came out, did you sort of, like, get on, like, big, big tours? Or do you still just play locally around Washington, Seattle? 
Well, we never really wanted to play um, locally. What we wanted to do, which, you know, Ted, Ed and I had played in a previous band locally quite a bit. And um, what we saw uh, happen with Queensryche is what we tried to duplicate. Queensryche never played a live show. Their first live show was opening for Dio, I believe. So they did their... Hell of a show. They figured out how to craft... Yeah, pretty great show to start with. They, They crafted, you know, an incredible EP... And uh, I remember before it came out, I, I think I was talking to Chris DeGarmo and one of the other guys in the band at Lake Sammamish in Seattle. And they were talking about how, you know, they put their own money into it and they just said, well, it's just money. You know, they were taking a risk. And, you know, because you never know, they could record it and nothing could happen with it. And, and they took the risk. And next thing you know, I was hearing it on, on KISW, uh, Seattle radio station, which was a major station. It was what's called a P1 with over a million listeners. And they were playing Queen of the Reich, and I thought it was new Judas Priest. I was like, who the heck is this? And, uh, you know, just a fabulous EP that, again, stands the test of time. And uh, But that's we were inspired by them, so we were trying to basically do the same thing. Awesome. Awesome. And then kind of moving to the next album, time will tell, tell because usually with the, the debut album, you have like your entire life to write and there's a lot of hype with the first album. But when it came time to making a time will tell, did you feel like pressure to follow up the self-titled? I don't think so. I think we were too young and ignorant to really worry about the pressure. <laughs> I think we just, we just wanted to, you know, we just wanted to follow the same, philosophy make write great songs make a great record that really you know speaks to us and then hopefully people will dig it and we en- enlisted uh, terry brown from rush fame rush was one of our favorite bands and so we got terry brown to uh, do the record with us in new york city and uh you know i think another incredible record and one of the one of my greatest memories is i, I was <clears throat> on tour with uh, i think house of lords at that point and uh, the record wasn't going well. There was going to be another drummer. And uh, Eric Carr lent me his kit to, to play on that wow. record. And so I came, I was in for like a couple of days and played on that album. And, uh, you know, working with Terry Brown playing on Eric Carr's kit was kind of a kind of a uh, uh, important moment for me. It was just one of those things you just go, how cool is that? I'm working with the producer that that worked with Neil Peart and I'm um, playing on Eric Carr from Kiss's drum set. You know, what could be better, right? Yeah. Yeah. Can't go wrong there, man. Man. And I noticed there was like also like a four year gap or three year gap between self-titled and time will tell back. Well, I know you had like two splits. You did in between that. Now, what was the reason for like the three, three year gap? Yeah. Did you really want to like take your time to like hone your craft for time will tell? Well, I think it was really only a two. Well, but I think it came out. I'm trying to remember what the epic release was. I think the epic release date was maybe '88. It was actually August, the first August, tw- August 23rd, 1989, through Epic Records. Which one? Which one is it? I think it was the Epic Records one. Well, I know there's like a couple other versions, but I'm just going from what Metal Archive was that, says. Was that? Are you talking about self-titled? Or time will tell. Yeah, the self-titled, I think, came out in 88. And so it was really only, you know, basically they, they took that, that album and they, the original Shrapnel release and they put new um, a new cover on it and remastered it, which is a great testament to how well we crafted the record. And they put it out on Epic. I think it was 1988. And then I think Time Will Tell came out in 1989. So, and then there was a huge gap. There's like 28 years between that and um the third secret and that's yeah. largely because you know the grunge movement in seattle which was ironically um uh, also from seattle along with us but the grunge movement kind of just wiped out everything metal all the metal bands lost their record deals and back then there was no internet no uh, social media to be able to keep in contact with your fans so we were pretty much done at that point and then we played uh, the kit festival in 2010 in germany yeah. And, and really we're exposed to the idea that, wow, there's a lot more fans for Fifth Angel um, on, a, on a global basis than we were aware of. And so we did Third Secret in 2018, and we just released um, When Angels Kill in 2023. And as you know, there's a big little bit of a gap in there. A lot of that had to do with COVID and, and a lot of other things. We weren't sure, you know, what was going to happen. Are we still going to have a record label? Are the, are the record companies going to go out of business? You know, we didn't even know, but... We're very excited about the new record, and 
I'm just kind of moving to that because we're we're down to about like uh, I've got I've got another interview at, at 12:30, so I'm just trying to be um, cognizant yeah. of that and try to make sure we get everything in that we need to get in. But the yeah. new album is out now. It's also on nu- Nuclear Blast, and it's a double concept, double vinyl concept record. And what we tried to do with this is something unique and different. We tried to encapsulate all of the ideas from the three previous records and even took some of the song titles here and there and lyrics and wove them into this story, a concept record that's uh, it's almost 70 minutes long. There's some some cool interludes and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, an album that, you know, we really did our best to try to make sure we retain some of the elements that are classic in Fifth Angel, like the really singable courses. And so we just played the Kit Festival in Germany this summer. And, you know, it was really amazing because, you know, we've got thousands of people singing all the old songs and we played the two new songs. And see, these are songs that they didn't even know. And they're singing along to the two new songs, just like they did the old song. So we, we feel like, you know, we feel like we did the right thing on the new record. Record. And with this out, album because because i like like i know this was like the follow-up to the comeback album did you want to sort of like pick up on with with when angels killed wanted to continue in that same vein on the third secret or do you want to try something new well what we did uh you know third secret we were originally talking about making that into a concept record but it's not a concept record and some people think that it is but it's actually not and we we sort of uh, waited until this record to really uh, do that so i would say and in terms of similarities, there are some similarities between Third Secret and this album. I think uh, the aggression, you know, on Third Secret, we wanted to make sure we sounded like Fifth Angel. And then at the same time, we wanted to sound like we moved forward and grew as a band because we were all older. You know, we're better musicians. Uh, you know, we, we wanted to kind of explore maybe a little bit more progressive of an edge um, and a little more aggressive of an edge. And then on, on uh, When Angels Kill, I think we even went further. It's maybe even a little bit more progressive and, again, a little bit more aggressive. So, and that was intentional. Yeah. Yeah, and, of course, you also have a new member. You have your fellow Flotsam and Jetsam bandmate, Steve Connolly, joining. Like, what kind of, like, el- elements that he brought into Fifth Angel with him joining the band? Well, you know, he, I'm not sure he really joined the band. He, he helped us out on this record. Um, I guess the best way to describe it is uh, it's sort of like a Halloween pump, Pumpkins United kind of thing where, you know, they had like uh, three singers and four guitar players and, you know, all these different players over the years that sort of helped with the record. And this album was very similar. We had uh, Ed Archer had some problems with his hands at one point. Uh, he was going through some interesting uh, medical issues, and so we had we brought in Steve Connolly, and he came in and did some some great work on the record. We also brought in Jim Dafka, Ethan Brosh, co-wrote two of the songs. So it was like a family of guitarists that we actually used uh, to make this record, and I think it actually made it uh, uh, kind of a more diverse and, and kind of a cooler record, in my opinion. Yeah, and it was also like a first. We well, also had a new vocalist. Well, he's not new now, but he's new to the album. Steve Van Carlson said, so, "Would you feel like nervous, like like having like because when anytime when bands like change new sing, change singers, it's always like will it work or won't it work? Because like for example, when Iron for Iron Maiden when they when they they got Bruce Dickinson in the band, people didn't think think it would work, but when put out Number of the Beast and it's just that classic album, and it pretty much solidified sort of like the Maiden sound. Right. Oh, absolutely. Well. Yeah, I, I didn't really worry about it with Steve. I mean, you know, if you listen to the album, I mean, he's he's such an amazing singer. I mean, I think he's got an incredible, uh, incredible voice. So I, I think right there, you know, yeah, it's always a, a risk when it's something different. But if you listen to Ted and you listen to Kendall and you listen to Steve, I think there's plenty of commonalities. And I don't think they really sound all that different in the fact that, you know, that, that stylistically and musically, you know, the songs are the songs and um, they have a little bit of a different take on it, but I don't think it's so far that it's going to alienate our, any of our fans or anything like that. Yeah. All right. And kind of in the end, I, cause I know you're starting to run out of time, time. What's next for the fifth angel, Joel, have you got like any tours lined up, up or anything with the, the release of, well, of the new the album? Moments, 
I'm sorry. What was that? Sorry, I kind of got cut off. So, so what's kind of like next? Have you got like any tours lined up or anything else that you would like to plug? Plug whether it be a Fifth Angel or Flotsam and Jetsam. Well, we, we sure we we certainly want to get out there, and you know we love being with fans. We love playing kit. Um, one of the challenges you have right now are just the cost of touring have exploded. You know, it's 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 roughly twice as much to tour now as it used to be. You know, maybe two years ago, or maybe even a year ago, and so that's that's really kind of biting into things. Um, hopefully, uh, you know, we'll be able to reach a point where we can book some some uh, shows in the fall or maybe the spring of next year. We're certainly looking at all those options now. No. Awesome. So, so before we go, I just want to thank you for this interview, Ken. Thank you for taking the time to do this. Is just, just any final words you want to say to close this out? Yes, just want to thank you so much, Richard, for doing the interview. And we want to thank our fans that have supported us over all these years. You know, we know it's been it's been a very long time and, and uh, we really do appreciate you. You know, we, we always think of our fans when we're when we're trying to make a piece of art and we're always doing everything we can to make it excellent and enjoyable for the fans. So that's, that's all I'd really like to say is thank you so much for, for uh, keeping us doing what we're doing. Awesome. So everybody, Ken from fifth angel, we'll see you next time.